Scripture reading this morning will be coming from the book of Matthew, and we'll be reading from chapter 26, verses 48 through 56. Matthew, chapter 26, verses 48 through 56. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled, that it must happen thus? In that hour Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. It happens from time to time. And sometimes it happens when you least expect it. Sometimes it happens when it's not a good time. But God is always there for the faithful Christian when it does happen. What are we talking about? We're talking about times when we are forsaken. You may not need this lesson today, but in time you probably will. You might need it this afternoon. You might not need it for five years. But in time, you'll probably need this lesson. Somebody will forsake you. Somebody will leave you hanging, as we say, and kind of leave you, maybe leave you in a lurch, as we might phrase it at times. When I think about being forsaken, I think sometimes when people get cancer and they know they're not going to get well, they may think that God has forsaken them. Sometimes when people go through difficulties in their lives with marriage or with children or with their jobs or maybe even a really good friend and things just go the wrong way, they may think that, well, God has forsaken me. I don't want to be over the top or over responsive or brusque. God does not forsake anybody. Now sometimes we forsake him. God does not forsake anybody. I think that's the key to the lesson this morning. But you think about being forsaken Number one, forsaken is inevitable. In other words, it is going to happen. We don't know when. Sometimes we don't, don't understand why. The Apostle Paul probably is the most recognized character besides Jesus in all of the New Testament. And because we read about him in the New Testament, he may be the most recognized character in the Bible, or maybe we would put David up there pretty high, and I know that we would. And there were times that David felt forsaken. He loved God. He lived for God. In 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, rather, chapter 1, beginning with verse 15, Paul is writing to Timothy, this young evangelist who preaches in the city of Ephesus. And obviously there was a relationship between Paul and Timothy that was very unique. Obviously, you would think that Timothy would lean on Paul, that he would look up to him as as a shoulder to lean on and a mentor to follow. But when Paul writes this last letter that he ever wrote, as we would understand it from chapter 4, he talks about his death being imminent. 
He's leaning on Timothy. He's talking to Timothy. And he says, I want to tell you something, Timothy. You're aware of the fact that all who were in Asia turned away from me. Now, when you think about that, there were churches all in Asia, different congregations of the Lord's church. And I was looking at one commentator's ideas about this, and he said, I don't believe Paul is talking about all those churches. He obviously is talking about people who were his friends, his associates, people that that he had depended on and worked together with, and they've abandoned him. Now, that may sound odd to us, but but it has happened. All those people in Asia, they've turned away from me. You remember when Paul wrote the Philippian letter that there were people who kind of distanced themselves from Paul because he was in prison for preaching. Maybe they looked at that as some kind of shame. And, you know, Paul would tell Timothy, don't be ashamed of me in my bonds. Don't be ashamed of me for being in jail. Isn't it interesting why sometimes people will cut off their friendship with folks? Paul was preaching the gospel and went to prison for it. And he says, all those who are in Asia have turned away from me. He's writing to to Timothy and he says, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Now, if you look in your Bible concordance, you'll only find those names in, in Scripture right here. We don't know who Phygelus and Hermogenes were, but Timothy must have known. He says, Timothy, these guys have forsaken me. And obviously, Timothy would have known that there was a relationship. It's kind of like, even these guys. There are some people we know that might turn away from us or distance themselves from us at times and, and not stay close to us. But then there's some, you just don't expect them to abandon you, but they will. I have learned this about people. People will do just about anything, whether you expect them to or not. And sometimes people who are very close to you are the ones that will let you, let you down first. It doesn't make any sense but it happens. It's inevitable that it's going to happen. What's interesting, if you go read in Acts chapter 19 and verse 10, you'll find that Paul spent two years in Asia preaching the gospel. And you think, well, why would those people that he preached to and obviously had worked with and gotten close to, why would, why would they abandon him? Well, we really don't know why they did because he doesn't say why they did. And obviously he's reaching out to Timothy and and he's probably reaching out. He's hurting a little bit. These people have abandoned me. Doesn't that hurt when people abandon you? When they distance themselves from you, when they forsake you? I think about Paul. he, He experienced a great deal of opposition while he was in Asia. When he was preaching, turn over to 2 Timothy Chapter 4, verses 14 through 17, where Paul says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. At my first defense, now this is when he went, he was on trial for preaching the gospel. Let me ask you a question. Put this on pause for just a second. What is God's power to salvation. It is the gospel. We talked about it in our class this morning. The gospel is good news. And, and I find it interesting when you try to teach some people the gospel, they get upset with you about good news because that's what it is. Paul had spent two years preaching there and then he finally gets arrested for preaching and he says that in my first defense, no one stood by me or supported me. Sometimes you think that if you preach the gospel, you'll just get all kind of support from the church. How many of you have found yourself alone sometimes in teaching it? Nobody would do it with you. Paul would do it. He says, nobody, even when I was on trial, they deserted me. But you know, Paul didn't get upset with these people. He's just bearing his soul, I suppose, to Timothy. He says, but, you know, don't, Don't let it be counted against them. I'm not not going to dwell on that. I'm just telling you that they did. And 
It seems obvious that Paul is reaching out to Timothy at this time to just bear his soul a little bit. Everybody needs somebody like that that you can talk to and that know you and understand and will listen to you. Then I think about Jesus in the text that Will just read to us a moment ago. Now, if you go read John chapter 16, verses 32 and 33, you will find that Jesus had told these disciples that their deserting of him when he was being arrested was going to occur. He says, Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, to leave me alone. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying to God. He goes before the Father three times in intense prayer to the point that Luke would say that he used a bloody sweat. He was under such agony. Judas is out here working his dirty deed to, to, to betray him. And so Judas comes with all the, the men who are to arrest Jesus. Peter pulls out his sword and cuts off the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest. Jesus heals the man, puts his ear back and heals it and says, Peter, put your sword away. Those who live by the sword will die by it. You've got to love Jesus' attitude. But he said, you know, you're going to leave me alone. Brethren, when the Lord was in Gethsemane, he goes a stone's throw away even from Peter, James, and John to talk to his father. And then when he's arrested, everybody leaves. I know he was a son of God, but he also had human feelings. Can you imagine how alone he might have felt at that point? And he goes in there and he goes through all these tribunals, all these trials from, from the Jewish priests and ultimately before Pilate, the governor of that region. And, and they have him beaten till he was nearly dead. And then Pilate brings him out and presents him to, presents him to the people. And he says, behold the man, look at him. I figure Jesus looked very, very bad even at that point. He's not even been crucified yet. And they've got this fellow Barabbas. It was customary to turn a prisoner loose once a year at this time. And they got Barabbas, an insurrectionist, and a murderer. And then he's got Jesus. What do you want me to do with Barabbas? Let him go. What about Jesus? They didn't say kill him. They said crucify him. And he's standing there all alone. Now let me just pause for a quick, quick point. Was Paul right in preaching the gospel? Was he right to go and lay his life on the line, as it were, for preaching the gospel? What about Jesus, the sinless son of God? Was he, was he right to do, well, you know everything he did was perfect before God, and yet here is a man who's perfect in his life, sinless, totally pleasing to his father, and he's alone by people who have been with him three years. People who left their fishing nets to go follow Jesus. They saw his miracles. They heard his sermons. They saw him dealing with the woman of Samaria. Everything he did. But I tell you what, when it got tough, they left. Let me tell you something. You and I are no different. Abandonment, being forsaken, is at times inevitable. If you live for the Lord, there are people who will not stand by you. And you might be surprised who some of those people are. Sometimes the own battle, the battles take place in our own homes. And I'm talking about Christians and Christians. Sometimes even people who are strong Christians and they have strong Christians in their homes, they may stand alone on some biblically solid, sound issue. Well, let me say this about it. Paul did what was right. Jesus did what was right. We do what's right, even if people abandon us, even if they forsake us. 
But it's going to happen. If it happened to David, if it happened to Paul, if it happened to the Son of God, it is inevitable that it will happen to you and that it will happen to me. You bring it into our culture, sometimes wives are forsaken. We know that personally here at Adel, don't we? Sometimes husbands are forsaken. We know that personally here at Adel too. It hurts. And nobody's going to deny that. The reality doesn't make you feel any better, but it is real and it does happen. And so we get, we'll get to the end of the lesson to see what we do, but we recognize, number one, don't be shocked if it does, even by people who you would think would never do it. Because Peter said, why, Lord, <laughs> well, I'll die with you. If the text says after he cut off Malchus's ear, if the text says they all fled, then they all fled, including Peter. And even when he was on trial, Peter stood at a, at a distance. He didn't want to get too close. And a little old servant girl got him to curse and swear about knowing the Lord. I imagine that made Jesus feel good, don't you? Here he is on trial for his life, and Peter's out there lying about knowing him, who just a little earlier said, you know, I, I would die with you. People don't intentionally lie. Sometimes we make promises we can't keep. And when the tough got going, Peter, Peter was not where he said he would be. Sometimes children are forsaken by their parents. I did some jail work several years ago, and there, there was a, a woman that I had the privilege of studying the Bible with, and she had all kinds of issues. Usually people in jail do. If they've been in and out very much, they've got some issues. And she went into a spiel. She said, you know, my daddy deserted me when I was little. I don't like men. And that led to some inappropriate behavior. She felt abandoned by her daddy. She says, you know, Mr. Roger, I dreamed that, that he came home, but he, he didn't come home and he probably never will. She, was, she felt abandoned, forsaken. It's understandable. I, I read some years ago that there were some mothers down in the country of Peru who, uh, who were so struggling so much financially, they would actually sell their children to be able to survive. I imagine that made their children feel good. Well, I, we say that tongue-in-cheek. It was actually on Primetime Live about... 20 years ago, I watched that and I thought, how can, of all people, you wouldn't expect your parents to abandon you? You see, that's why it's so hard at times for adoptive children to feel like they fit in. My mama didn't want me. I don't know how that feels, but I know it has to be a deep pain, but it happens. Sometimes aged parents are forsaken by their children, ignored, left in a nursing home to die. How many of you have been to nursing homes and the person will say, my kids never come to see me. I don't know what's going on in their lives. And I imagine that's a pretty empty feeling. There are things that happen that, that are surprising. I've known some really good, sound, solid gospel preachers who were forsaken by their congregation. I've known congregations that are really good, solid congregations and preachers just walk out on them. People do these things. They're real. Now, that's not a very pretty picture you're painting this morning, preacher. Well, it's not, but the thing about it is it's real. It's a real thing that happens. Sometimes people are forsaken and they're staying in the same house with folks. If you don't believe that's so, you haven't talked to very many people. Even in the, right there in your own house. Some people just go cohabitate. Just to make it work. If that you call it making it work. But it's real. But also, number two. Forsaking 
has inappropriate timing, doesn't it? I mean, it just never comes at a good time. Of all the times that Paul needed support was when he was in prison for preaching the gospel. Take him something. Whatever you can get in there. Timothy, I want you to come see me. You've got to read all the letters he wrote. Come, come, come see me. Bring my coat with you. You keep reading the text. Come see me, son. I just, I just want to see somebody. And I, I just don't imagine that Roman prison was very accommodative. I think it's ridiculous what people get, what people call prisons today. Or, but it was not a good place. I think about Jesus. Brethren, let's apply this momentarily. When people are hurting the most, let's be there the most. Of all the times that Jesus needed those 11 men to be with him, it was right there when he was being arrested. Well, you know you can arrest him, but we're, we're behind him 100%. That's our Lord. That's our Master. That's Jesus. That's the Christ. Peter confessed it, didn't he? That's the Son of God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I'll tell you what, I put my sword up, but I'm going to stand here by him all the way through. You think that he might do that. I've always appreciated the old World War II movies where you got these soldiers in a foxhole together and that guy's going to stay next to his buddy till one of them dies or both. They don't give up on each other. You know, the, the, the penalty for desertion can be very steep, or it used to be. You don't run out on your troops, on your country or whatever you're fighting for. Desertion is not it's frowned upon by everybody. Um, if we can appreciate then in a physical war, brothers and sisters, we are in a spiritual war. We're in a battle. Our commander-in-chief is Jesus. The sword of the Spirit, the Bible, is our battle equipment. You know what makes it work? Faith. You know what helps make it work better? Togetherness, unity, being together, standing beside one another, fighting the good fight of faith. And that's what Paul would tell Timothy in the last part of 2 Timothy 4. I fought the good fight of faith. I have done it. And he's passing the torch to Timothy. Timothy, I want you to, to stand by me, son. I need, because you see, turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and look at what Paul says. In verse 6, well, let me, let's just back up. Timothy, I want you to be sober in all things. I want you to endure hardship, Timothy, because it's going to come, son. Do the work of an evangelist, Timothy. You fulfill your ministry. Why, Paul? For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Paul knows he is about to die. The Bible does not record how Paul died. But secular history records that Paul was beheaded in Rome. Well, he knew it was going to happen. If God had wanted us to know specifically about Paul's beheading in the Bible, he would have given it to us. But that's not really the point. The point is, Timothy, I need you but when I'm gone, these are the things you need to do. Because, son, hardship's coming. And one of the hardships that he faced was not necessarily from the Jews. You know, they, they go on home and go about their business. But the brethren who wouldn't stand by him. Brethren, I'm going to say this, and I want you to think about what I'm going to say. Real, real, just take your time with it. We need each other Amen. we need each other and some of us need each other more than others and some of the people that you least suspect need help may need it the most they just won't tell you so so let's be a close people and keep our ears open and hear what people say and when they're struggling with something 
Well, I hope you get better and we go home. That's kind of what James talks about, you know, the hunger. You know, well, you know, they need clothes, but what about your faith? Faith without works is what? Dead. We, we need each other. The world out there could care less whether you breathe or not. They don't care. If we close this building up and never met in it again and put a sign out front closed, they wouldn't care. They might say something about it. If they cared, they'd be in here. But we care. But what really happens is what, what really matters what happens inside. And forsaking will probably come when you least expect it and maybe at a very low point in your life. So what then do we do? What is the response to it? I know Jesus leaned on his father. And you read the seven sayings of Christ from the cross. Yes, the father turned his back on his son. Not because of who he was, but because of what we did. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6 says, The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of of us all. That's why Jesus went to the cross. The father had to turn his back on his son because he took sin upon himself. God can't look on sin. But, he, but bear in mind, Jesus is talking to his father the whole time. That's what you do. There may be nobody else that cares about what you're thinking or what you're saying, or you think they don't. They do. You just think they don't. Brothers and sisters, if you're a Christian, God always cares. Amen. His ears are open to our prayers. And so when you think about the, the, the inalterable promise of God never forsaking us, I think about the people of God in, while they were in Babylonian captivity. In Isaiah chapter 49, this is a time period when they're coming back to Jerusalem. And verse 14 of Isaiah 49 says, but, but Zion said, this is God's people, the Lord has forsaken me and the Lord has forgotten me. Well, everything's not come back where it needs to be just yet. They're out of Babylon, but everything's not exactly where it needs to be yet. God works his restoration plans on his timetable, not ours. And sometimes you think, well, God has forgotten me. No, he hasn't. He may not be responding the way you want him to, just like a parent may not respond to a child when a child wants it to. God's smarter than a parent, and he's going to respond. And so he uses this illustration in verse 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Generally speaking, no, she can't. Usually they, they remember. Even these may forget. But I will not forget you. Who, God? Who? God's people. I will not Forget you. Behold, I've inscribed you on the palm of my hands. We think about the palm of your hand. God doesn't have physical hands, but in his spiritual hand is written the name of his people. Have you ever written a note in your hand so you wouldn't forget something? Yeah, you know, you don't have your notepad, so you write it in your hand. You don't want to forget this. If you're a Christian, I don't care how bad things are going. Your name is in God's hand. We need to be reminded of that. To remember that. And you know in 2 Timothy 4 verse 17 when Paul said, you know in verse 16 he said, you know everybody, everybody forsook me. But he said in verse 17, the Lord stood by me. I can't see Jesus except through the eye of faith. I know he died. I know he was buried. I know he was resurrected. I know he's sitting at God's right hand, but I cannot peel back the windows of heaven and see him. I just know he's there. And I know God the Father's there. 
And I know God the Holy Spirit is real. And I know this book is true. Now the question is, when I think about this, do I know it when I think everybody's forgotten me? God doesn't. Now we might forget him. We might forget God. Matter of fact, we probably do that more often than we realize. But God doesn't forget us. And Paul says, the Lord stood by me. Do you know what happened after Jesus yielded up his spirit? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting Psalm 22, 1. And, and, and then the next statement is, he, give, next, he gives up the ghost, gives up the spirit, and he dies and Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus take his body uh, after they requested of Pilate and they put it in Joseph's unused tomb. On the third day, he came out of it. Where is Jesus now? He's sitting at the right hand of God because God didn't forget his son. We forgot God. We sinned. Jesus died because of it. And God had to turn his back on him because of us. Not because of Jesus, but because of us. But he died alone. He died alone. But he's not alone now. Sometimes you are alone. What do you do? Sometimes we feel sorry for ourselves. That's kind of normal, isn't it? Sometimes we do. But I know this. Just as surely as a few moments ago, I had the privilege, the honor, of taking us before God's throne because He's there. <clears throat> and so when you struggle, people forsake you. It may come at the wrong time. Please don't forget to talk to God. But sometimes you may find a friend you can talk to. I think there are people in God's family right now who are hurting who won't talk to anybody. I have found at times if there's somebody that I trust that this is, this is not going anywhere else but just between us, I can walk away feeling better. I bore my soul. Now, there aren't many people you can trust like that. But if you tell somebody, this is not going anywhere, then that's what it needs to be. It's not going anywhere. And just talk to somebody. But most of all, talk to somebody who's God's child, who has the same goals in mind for life and hope for eternity that you do. In Hebrews 13 in verse 5, God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. And then one of the lines in that says, song says, Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? The next line is biblical. Take it. To the Lord in prayer. Talk to him. Find some way. Peter would tell us in 1 Peter chapter 5. In verse, verses 6 and 7. That we should cast all our anxiety. All our cares on the Lord. But he says in number, verse 6. Number one though you got to humble yourself. When the world has down on you. When you think everybody's forgetting, forgetting you. Humble yourself before God. You say, I need you today. I need you today. And Father, I'm probably going to need you tomorrow too. Matter of fact, I'm probably going to leave you, need you for a good while as I go through this. I'm going to need you. And that's dependence. Independence will kill you. It'll wreck your mind and your spirit. It'll break you. Independence from God will break you. Dependence on God will heal you. Peter says, humble yourselves under what? The mighty hand of God. 
Whose name is in his hand if you're a Christian? Yours is. Under his mighty hand that he may exalt you in due time. Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'll get you through this. I'll lift you up, but you've got to depend on me. Then he says, then he says, casting all, Lord, all of it, all of it. I don't know about this, Lord, all of it, all your anxiety or your care upon him. And then Peter says, because he cares for you. You're going to struggle. It's inevitable. It's not going to come at a good time. But there is a remedy for it. Because God's promise of never forsaking us is an inalterable promise. It's inalterable. Now, if we're not living for the Lord... If we're not giving ourselves to him, if we're not living like Christian people, we can't expect God to help us. Because he says, you've got to humble yourself before me if you really want me to help you. So let's not be independent. Let's be dependent. Let's be there for one another when we struggle. Just be there. But more than that, lean on God. Pray to him, talk to him. I need help. How long should you pray about it? Until you get finished. Until you get finished talking to him. I'm going to say this and I'm going to bring the lesson to a close. I don't know how many true 100% Christians there are in this world. But you know that every one of them can talk to God at the same time and hear them all at the same time and he can deal with them separately. That's the God we serve, brethren. That's the power of God. That's his mighty hand. Let us take hold of it. If there's some way that he can help you this morning, please come as we stand and sing.